In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We keep today the feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Catholic Christendom, it is her death day, and her death is described by two variants. The first is that she fell asleep she slipped away. The second is that she was taken bodily and directly to heaven. The alternatives are reflected in the dedication of churches. In Jerusalem, one Latin, Roman Catholic, and one Greek Orthodox church are, are dedicated to the Dormition of Our Lady, that is to say, the falling asleep. However, one little church, 14th century church, seven miles from where we are, in the village of Halton, is dedicated to the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So you pays your money and you takes your choice. But I want to leave that aside for the moment. Rather, it's a number 17 bus from the central Jerusalem bus station to the village of Ain Kerem, where John the Baptist was born. And it's the village where today's gospel took place. It's a beautiful village five miles west of Jerusalem in veritable hill country. Its name, Ein Kerem, means the spring in the vineyard. And there is a beautiful spring there which runs down the valley to the west. Here, Mary and Joseph from Nazareth in the north visit, they visited their cousinly relations in Ein Kerem. Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. The babe in her womb is said to have leapt with joy when Mary greeted her. That joyful and very personal greeting triggered the song of Mary, a song which expresses the joy of her pregnancy and proclaims the prophetic knowledge that through it, the Lord God would cause righteousness justice, what ought to be, praise for God to spring forth just as the earth brings forth what is sown in it. In the church of the visitation in Ain Kerem, the Song of Mary, the Magnificat, is written on its walls in every major language of the world and many minor ones. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. We know all these familiar world words. Mary seems to know that the birth will have almost cosmic proportions for all generation shall call me blessed and the holy one has looked down on little old me with favor francis pope francis has recently stated that the magnificat says all that needs to be said about mary it is complete and totally wonderful all this takes place in the setting of warm family life. Joseph has accepted Mary's pregnancy with a grace comparable only to his wife's gracious humility. Joseph of the house and lineage of the great Israelite King David seems to have acknowledged the old and mysterious description 
of messianic birth, the dew of which was the womb of the morning, celebrated elsewhere by a prophet with the words, drop dew, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness, and let the earth bring forth a savior. So much for the parturient Mary. The later image of Jesus, age 12, absorbed by the temple and the knowledge it imparted. Lost, thought to be lost because he stayed behind in the temple and his parents, Mary and Joseph, had to go back to look for him. Here is a picture of a boy that had a firm and loving basis of happy family life and a veritable school of virtues. And so to the ghastly fast forward. 30 years later, in the dusty used quarry just outside the west gate of Jerusalem, Mary stood with two other women and watched the last moments of her beautiful son, whom, whom she had received newborn in her arms. That moment will have caused the greatest ecstatic joy of a mother who holds the fruit of her womb for the very first time and whose eyes seek to lock with those of her newborn baby. Now all she sees is the twisted body of a grown man half destroyed by the vicious wounds and clotted blood of a severe flogging, a criminal outcast, human rubbish nailed to a cross to be finished off. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Is there any sorrow like unto my sorrow. I venture to think that this must represent the epitome of terrible and horrific maternal suffering. And so the image of Mary standing by the cross has become an icon of enormous resonance musically captured perhaps by Percolese's Starbat Mater Dolorosa. And why, I ask as an aside, why is it that sad, sad music in the minor key is often the most beautiful of the musical art? Now, Andrew, I think you've accidentally muted yourself. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was carried away. Um, <laughs> the, why is it that music is like that? Anyway, so we, to, to various aspects of language, we have understatement and overstatement. A veteran yesterday on the television from the Memorial Arboretum said he'd been through all the horrors of the Far East War and the terrible treatment of the Japanese captors, and he'd now reached the age of 95. Not bad, he said. Well, what he said, not bad, is understatement. It was blooming marvelous that he got to 95, or, or after all that. Compare and contrast that with a statement from an Arabic were an Arab worker welcoming his employer back after a holiday. The Effendi 
should never go away on holiday. For when you do so, the world becomes pitch. The sun, the moon and the stars lose their light. By God, it's terrible. All the people are sick with misery because you are away. Many thousands of them are dying. All the people. And wallahi, by God, nobody was ever like Effendi. That is called overstatement. <laughs> Our faith has its origins in a language and a culture which, which is not accustomed to British understatement. And the Mediterranean world is more happy with bellissimo than with not bad. So we have to reckon with reverential embroidery. If we like, if you like it, you could call it theological over the top. It is not purposely deceitful, but the result of the deep joy and contentment which follows the reception of the good news of the gospel. Two examples. Mary was so good all her life, and she was, after all, Theotokos, the mother of God. So she must have been taken bodily to heaven when she died. Note carefully, must have been. That is not evidence. It is like the, doc like the doctrine itself, an assumption. So the Pope made the assumption a statement of doctrine in 1950 when he declared that Mary had been taken bodily to heaven. That's one example. Another example is the Adam and Eve story and the fall and the transmission of sin by human conception. Eve is set up as a bad woman as opposed who got it all wrong and caused the, by conception or the whole of the rest of the world of mankind to be contaminated by evil by, by the evil of original evil. Mary was the exact opposite of that. She was the woman who did the right thing and put it all right. Now this is more complicated than that because the transmission of the sin of Adam and Eve is through human conception. So that this reaches down even to our 1662 prayer book, when a couple, a joyful couple, bring a baby to be baptized. The prayer book starts off with, for as much as this child was conceived and born in sin, not a very happy welcome. And furthermore, it says, in so much as children are baptized, they are undoubtedly saved, which implies a very big doubt about those who are not baptized. Well, I cannot believe that a God allows babies to fry eternally if they haven't had the baptism water splashed on them. I just don't believe that. I don't think it's right. But all this is part of over the toppery, of reverential embroidery. It's not done to deceive, it's done because we're carried away with the joy of what we are trying to do and to say. So, uh, then we must ask finally, what, well, then there's the other opposite, uh, the reaction to this over the toppery of re reverential uh, embroidery, the opposite is the very Protestant, very evangelical dislike and even hatred of Mary, which are one of our own congregation, Susanna, has drawn attention to in a recent Dearly Beloved letter. I can't, I can't really get my head around why, but they do. there are people of the very strong evangelical wing. It's a very male religion, a 
and they just don't like Mary. And they love any text which can be construed. Even, for example, at the wedding of Cana, where Jesus says to Mary, Aisha Mali Walak, which means, uh, steady on, dear mother. We don't want to get involved in this before the time. It's quite reverential, but they say it says in the translation, woman, what have I to do with thee? It's rude, and, and that's what they like. I, I, I find that all very difficult, and I agree with Susanna that there is a real problem there. But it is, of course, reaction. It's like Ian Paisley calling the Pope old red socks and the whore of Babylon. It's all over the top on the other end. Um, so what is then to finish is how should we regard Mary, the Virgin, the Mother of God, Theotokos, venerated indeed by the vast majority of Christians worldwide. Here on this, we have a clear command from the Lord himself, hanging on the cross, death descending on him, his last word was, it is finished. His next to last word was, I thirst. But before that, he gave this command to the disciple whom he loved, St. John, but also to every faithful disciple. Son, he said, behold, thy mother. Mother, he said, behold thy son. And from that day forth, John took Mary into his own house. We must take Mary into our churches, into our houses, and above all, into our hearts. One very last biblical glimpse of Mary. Acts 1, 14. There she is with the women, as it says, in the upper room with the apostles, working in the first instances for the church that she was to see made and of which we are part. Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art thou among women.